I remember how you told me I can trust you completely So why am I doubting When you prove that you fight for me You walk me through fire from our redemption Lord how could I question when you prove that you die for me you walk me through fire
Excuse me while I tune. <laughs> well, good morning. And welcome to Roseland United Methodist Church. This is our praise and worship service. If it's your first time here, we extend a warm and loving welcome. So glad you're here. And uh, if you need anything, just ask one of the, our ushers. If you're joining us online, we welcome you also. Um, it's glad to, we're glad you're tuning in. And uh, we'll have, hopefully we'll have a, a great praise and worship service. And you'll get a lot out of it. Um, Cindy, do you have anything to tell us? Cindy, we'll come up. A few yes. things, not a lot. Good morning, everyone. Hey, it's a wonderful Sunday. Isn't it beautiful outside? Oh, my gosh. So guess what? The youth are having a bake sale today. It's the first Woo! one in who knows how long, but it's going to benefit. It's a mission one, and all the proceeds will benefit Uncor oh. for Louisiana and for um, uh, Haiti. So if you have, and it's donations only, so if you have a little bit of an appetite, head that way after service. Um, after service? Oh. Yeah, after service and before the in between. Oh. <laughs> and today at 4 p.m., uh, come back to church. We're going to have an old-fashioned hymn sync, and a group from Indian River City UMC Choir and their pianist will be traveling down from Titusville to join us. So if you're not here this morning, come on back at 4, wear your mask. We're all going to sing. It's going to be wonderful. Um, next Sunday, Pastor Jerry's going to be offering a six-week study on the book Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. If you'd like to participate, just come on uh, down. I'm I, I'm sure we can get the book. So uh, order it at Amazon, either Kindle order, or whatever. Order at Amazon or on Kindle. Like yep, yep. And then this Saturday, September 11th, the United Methodist Men will have a uh, breakfast 8 a.m. at Country Ham and Eggs. I like to call it Green Eggs and Ham, but <laughs> wherever y'all go, we'll see you there. Have a wonderful worship. Thanks, Cindy. We got one more announcement. Oh, one more announcement. Right, I'm sorry. She's I'm coming up. Right, I'm sorry. She's coming up. Jan Mahalik is coming up. What you got for us, Jan? Hi, everybody. Hi. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jan Mahalik. And um, who here loves to have fun? Meet new people. Well, last year we held the pumpkin patch, and it was a huge success. And the proceeds from the pumpkin patch benefit our church, the preschool, and the Navajo Indians who grow the pumpkins. Um, I do want to let you know that this year we are having the pumpkin patch again, but this year we are including two Saturdays as festival days. Now, during these two Saturdays, we are going to have a bake sale, a hot dog and burger sale with soda and water, story time and the sale of the pumpkins we will also there will also be the trunk or treat and if you have any questions please contact patty or linda derosier <clears throat> and um if you would like to participate in our pumpkin patch there's sign up sheets in the back of the church and out in there and um if you have any questions you want to do something special if you don't want to heat up your kitchen, we can have a bake day here at the church, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, we love our children. We love our families. We want to make this a huge success this year. So we appreciate anything that you have and anything that you can do for us. Thanks, Jana. Yeah. Thank you, Jan. We're going to start our service off this morning with... Holy is the Lord, if you could please stand. Holy is the Lord, isn't he? And we thank you so much, Lord, for being with us this morning and being in this place. We, we thank you for that beautiful sunrise. We thank you for just being here with us. And please fill us with your spirit this morning. We stand and lift up our hands Oh, the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down, we worship Him now How great, how awesome is He Together we sing Everyone 
one who sings. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. Hold on. Got to get the beat. Hold on. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. We stand and lift up our hands. Can you lift them? For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down. We worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. Together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord. God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. It's rising up all around. It's the anthem of the Lord's renown is rising up all around. It's the anthem of the Lord's renown. Together we sing, everyone sing. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty, the earth filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. All right. Maybe seated. Stephen? Now that we are awake, Let us let God know that we are his. Let us pray. God, you've blessed us so richly this day. You've given us life. You've given us hope. You've shared your love. We ask that you continue to make yourself be known through the scriptures and through the word that Jerry's going to share with us. Life is short, and yet you are with us all the way, every step of the way. We pray that our words are your words, and our actions are your actions. For we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ who gave us the prayer to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Ah. You need Jesus in your life? How many of you need Jesus in your life? Raise your hand. I need him. Oh, 
won't be my anthem Lord, when the world has fallen quiet You stand beside me Give me a song in the night In Jesus, I need you Every moment, I need you Hear now this grace part heart Sing out your praise forever for ashes you'll find a word beauty for ashes you find the weak and contrite heart shoulder its burdens and carry
eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Believe. I believe. Do you believe? I believe. If you believe, what's the name above all names? Jesus. Say it like you believe it. Do you believe that Jesus is the name of all names? If you do, say Jesus. Jesus. I love it. You know, it's funny how the people in a church can go, Jesus. And the people on a basketball court go, Jesus. I'm just saying. Where's your passion? Where's your passion? So if you came here expecting to find some meek and mild preacher, you're in the wrong church, friends. Oh, can we go ahead and throw that splash up for today's topic? All right, I appreciate that. I'll see if this thing works. I don't even know if it's turned on. Is it turned on? Is it? And it's the right button, not the left button? Yes. All right, you've heard it from HQ. Here we go. So uh, finish this phrase, don't judge a book by its cover. cover. Why? You don't know what's really going on inside. There's a quote that's attributed to Mark Twain that says, clothes make the man. So this guy in this splash, this opening picture, is obviously a businessman. He's wearing a dress shirt and a tie. And what do you suppose is happening? Heart attack. attack. So don't judge a book by its cover. Clothes may cover up something that you're not aware of. Um... When I was in seminary, I worked as the IT guy at a small railroad company. Uh, it's called a short line railroad, and uh, R.J. Corman. And uh, we had a president. His name was Tom, and he was a VMI graduate. Anybody know what VMI is? Somebody's waving. Your dad went there. Good. So I, I imagine the discipline in your home was pretty clear and swift. Yes. It's about as military as you can get, let me tell you. VMI. So Tom kept his military bearing throughout his military career and then as president of R.J. Corman Railroad Company. The guy was ancient. He was about my age then. And, uh, and I was just blown away. This guy could outlift me, and I still did powerlifting, but he could outlift me. He ran every day, three, four, five miles, depending. And uh, one day, Tom was running, and his heart exploded. And he was dead before he hit the track. That's exactly what we said. Wow. If this could happen to a guy that looked like that, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Let's see if I can make this do what I want it to do. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I'm telling you, it doesn't take much to thrill me. There it is, okay? Ah, The prophet Samuel, anybody ever heard of him? Yeah, good story. If you don't know it, dig into your Old Testament. You're going to love this old guy. The prophet Samuel was sent by God to Bethlehem. Any stories you know about Bethlehem? Oh, a few of them, including the birth of the Christ, right? Well, they were going back a few centuries, you know, into his great, great Daniel's day. But Samuel was sent by God to Bethlehem to anoint the next king of Israel. What was his name going to be? David. But on the way to Bethlehem, the prophet Samuel ran into a young man. He was tall, dark, and handsome. There you go. You know, he's the guy. And he thought that, and God said this to him. He said, the Lord said to Samuel, do not judge or consider by his what? Or his height. For I have... Now, it doesn't mean the guy's a bad guy. It doesn't mean he's on the most wanted list for the FBI. It just means that for this job, for this time, he's not the guy. That's all it means, okay? Uh, And that happens to us. We think we're the guy or the gal, and it's our season and our time and our team, and it doesn't work out that way, okay? So don't feel bad uh, for this guy. Eliab just wasn't the guy for the time. 
All right, and if it's not your time for something you set your heart on, uh, don't be heartbroken. Just say, well, God's got something else, all right? So here's what happened next. The Lord does not look at things that man looks at. Did you notice that? All right, we look at what? It's in yellow, in case you need a hint. We look at the outward appearance. The Lord's look at our heart. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see our gender or skin color. What? It's pretty obvious to us. You know, it just is. I mean, that's the first thing that hits us, frankly. Um, and then God doesn't see the clothes we wear, although we can tell when somebody's casual, and we're all pretty casual. That's just who we are. We can tell when somebody's dressed to the nines, right? Which, what does that mean, anyway? Really dressed nice. Probably going out to a, you know, a nine o'clock dinner engagement, whether or dancing or something. But they didn't just throw on a pair of jeans and call it a day. Uh, so here's the deal. God doesn't look at that. He doesn't look at the kind of car you drive or the house that you live in, but we notice those things. God doesn't even consider our health or our wealth. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips who? The call. The one who says, it's your job for this time. Let's go. All right, so uh, the Bible says that God looks upon the heart. And he's not looking at the physical heart. He's looking upon our thoughts and our motives. In other words, God looks at our character. Some jobs require a character that can handle the pressure. In fact, most jobs, quite honestly. Um, So the question I want each of us to ask ourselves this morning is this, is my heart right with God? And don't do that in the pejorative sense, you know, if you died tonight, are you sure you're going to go to heaven? I hope that's true. But I want you to ask yourself, seriously, is my heart right with God? Each of us knows, to greater or lesser extent, what God has put us on the earth for at this season of our life. For some of you, you're parents, and it's pretty obvious your number one job is to raise up the next generation. Others are grandparents, pretty sure that your job is to help raise those grandkids without getting in the way of the parents whose primary job it is. Some of us are still have a vocation, but our avocation is always to represent Christ, to bring hope, to be a help instead of a hindrance. So we know all these things. So the question is, is my heart right with God? With what God has revealed to me about who I am to be in this season of life, am I living up to God's hope and equipping and expectation? If not, before we leave here this morning in this communion service, I want to make sure we get our heart right with God. But you know... The truth is, most of us are confused about our heart, but maybe not as confused as little Johnny. Little Johnny, his first day in kindergarten, they had the kids stand up and cite the Pledge of Allegiance. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. And, and so the teacher was instructing them. He said, kids, put your hand over your heart. And every one of the kids did this, except Johnny. Johnny put his hand right here. And the teacher says, Johnny, that's not your heart. And he says, no, ma'am, you're wrong. My grandma pats right here and says, bless your little heart. (laughs) I say that to say this, in all seriousness. Is your heart right with God? Or is it placed somewhere else? Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 says this. Read it with me, because it's true, and we don't want the diagnosis. This is worse than getting a diagnosis for cancer. But it is true, and that's why the prescription is Jesus Christ. Read it with me, would you? The human heart is most deceitful and wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But the Lord searches all hearts and examines secret motives. So here's what I know about you because you're human. Here's what I know about me because I have to live with me, okay? And Lisa lives with part of me, but not the part that's inside of my head or inside of my heart. I have to live with that just like you do. God searches all hearts. And that is a big all. It includes you and it includes me. And so he examines not just the motives we're pleased with, that we're happy to make sure people see, but he sees everything. He knows when our heart is not right towards him or towards other people or even towards ourselves. And sometimes a broken heart, a broken heart can be broken by grief, by loss, by pain, by sadness, by pride, by a million things that can take our heart from where God wants to have it and move it to some place where Satan can play havoc in our lives and the lives that God has entrusted us to. So the question again this morning is, do you know where your heart 
is. You know, religion. Religion is not a bad thing, but it can, can be a shell game. Everybody familiar with the shell game? Yeah, yeah. So right here, right here, can you see that? It's right there. All right, follow the bouncing ball. All right, all right. So, all right, so where is the ball? How many believe it's in the middle? How many think it should be on the right? Oh, no, you've got good eyes. Don't, don't do anything in front of her. Don't take an extra cookie, all right? Uh, how many of you think it should be on the left? Just a couple of lefts, a couple of rights, but you know what? This time, it was in the middle. Woohoo! Well, you know, that's the problem. I'm never that level. All right. So, but religion can be like a shell game where we try to hide our heart from God. And we certainly try to hide our heart from other people. Catch me if you can. You know, it's not really a sin unless you get caught, right? My mama would bake cookies and she'd say, Junior, you can have three. That's pretty generous, wouldn't you think? Unless you're a 140 pound fourth grader. And I'm like, are you kidding, mom? That's an appetizer. I wouldn't say that, but I'm thinking it. So guess how many cookies I'd take? I'd take enough, just enough, one less than enough that she wouldn't notice. But she noticed every time because she had your eyes. <laughs> so we do that with God. We think we're playing a shell game. Well, I went to church. That buys me a couple of sins this week. I put some money in the offering plate. There's another. This is a bonus. Okay. You know, I can try to hide that thought or that feeling or that action from God. And so religion becomes a shell game where we think we're hiding our heart from God by what we do. Um, do you know the greatest stumbling block to the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is Christ living in us. It's Christ giving voice and hands and feet to the world through us. So do you know the greatest obstacle, the greatest stumbling block to the kingdom of God? You think it's murder? Anybody think it's murder? It's exactly it. It's not murder. It's not adultery. It's not all these other ugly things that we think somehow disqualify somebody for the kingdom of God. What it is is pride. Anybody ever heard of the unforgivable sin? You know the only sin that can be forgiven? Do you know what it is? It can be anything. It's the sin that you do not confess. The unforgivable sin. You cannot be pardoned for that which we do not own and give up to God. You just can't. So here's the deal. God wants to forgive us, but we are happy playing a shell game. No, no, really, God, I'm pretty good. No, no, don't look under here. <laughs> That's between me and me, not between me and thee. So, but the problem is God searches all hearts, including yours and mine, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's known to him completely, even if we hide it from ourselves. Anybody ever heard of the guy W.C. Fields? Yeah, yeah. You know, time is kind to some people, and some people have forgotten that W.C. Fields was a hard-drinking, kid-hating, womanizing curmudgeon. He was not the kind of guy you wanted at your party, but he was a powerful man in Hollywood, and so he made some films. Uh, they have, they, it's a dark humor, but it's humorous, but most people who would look at those today would realize it's misogyny. He's just a mean guy and got away with it because of the time and the age. Uh, but W.C. Fields supposedly was caught reading the Bible towards the end of his life. Can you imagine? And he was confronted. And he, he what are you doing, W.C.? Why would you read a Bible? And he says, oh, yes, <laughs> I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> I say that to say this. Are you looking for loopholes? We want to do this and don't do that kind of religion that makes us feel safe, that makes us feel clean even though we know we're not. We want to keep our spiritual focus here and here instead of where it needs to be, where the Holy Spirit is pushing hard for us to reveal and to confess what God already knows. God has searched your heart and my heart and God knows. So Jesus pushed against this idea of an external religion, this idea that what I do on Sunday makes up for what I did on Friday and Saturday nights. Okay. Uh, Mark 7, 14. Just listen. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, 
Listen to me and understand this. We've been called together in this church this morning for this very talk. So Jesus is not just saying historically. Jesus is saying to you and me right now here in this place, listen to me and understand. Nothing outside of a person can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. So what do you suppose he's saying there? What do you suppose he's saying? Unclean means what? Dirty, unrighteous. In other words, I know how I should be towards my wife, my husband. I know how I should act towards the kids, the grandkids, the neighborhood kids, the people agree with me and disagree with me in every aspect of life. I know how I should be. You know, so it's not the news media that's fomenting your anger. The anger's already inside of you. And it's what's inside of you that makes those things that you can't believe you just said or the things you just did come out of you. And you go, wow. It's because it's not coming out of the good part over here, and it's not coming out of the good part over here. It's coming out of the part you thought you'd hidden from God and from others and yourself until it's revealed to all. And it usually happens at the worst possible moment. You're not made clean or unclean by anything you do or refrain from doing. Although there is clearly right and wrong, there is clearly good and evil, and you should err on the side of good and err on the side of what is not evil. But ultimately, it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. Religious leaders were finding fault with Jesus and his disciples. You know what they were arguing about in this particular passage? They weren't washing their hands correctly. They weren't. Think about recent history. How many of you learned how to rewash your hands at the beginning of COVID? What song do you sing? Jesus loves me? Happy birthday? You know, yeah, yeah. And you got to get lots of soap. How many hands got raw in the first month of this nonsense? All right. Well, they're arguing not because of the amount of water or soap. They're arguing with Jesus and his disciples because when they wash their hands, they're not praying the right prayer. Now, that sounds really pious, doesn't it? But who are they trying to school? the Son of God. <laughs> so Jesus challenged that tradition. You know, and if you're going to get challenged by God, shut up and listen. I just want you to tell you right now, that's you know, a good piece of advice. So they challenged their traditions, but he always upheld God's law. He said he didn't come to set aside the law of God, but to fulfill it. But he did push hard and regularly against the traditions of man, where it was the shell game. This makes me clean. And Jesus says, yeah, but you're a whitewashed tomb. You look good on the outside, but you look what on the inside? Dead, bad, full of dead men's bones. So God's law is there to protect our heart. Jesus didn't say anything against the law, but he did push against traditions. And he still does, by the way. So after he left the crowd, continuing the story, and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. This whole series is about what Jesus has taught about life, about the kingdom of God. So this is the parable. Talking about, you know, the parable, the, the story is likening uh, clean and unclean uh, food uh, to what makes a person righteous or unrighteous. So it's a parable. Uh, and he said, uh, don't you see that nothing that enters a man from outside can make him unclean? Now, how many of you would Go ahead. And, is it the blowfish that's like deadly to most people? How many would you eat sushi? Which one was it? The lionfish. And you're not lion. I know. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not a big sushi fan. She's less so. Okay. Uh, but you wouldn't, you know, well, you got a one in four chance of surviving dinner. Why would I sign up for that? You know, I've got some friends who cook like that. I won't go to their house. Okay. Uh, <laughs> He says, don't you see that nothing entering from outside can make a man unclean? For it doesn't go where? It doesn't change your character, okay? You can eat anything once. Everything in moderation. You go, what? I don't know. It comes out of your Bible and mine. It doesn't mean be stupid. It means be smart. So, for it doesn't go into his heart, goes where? Into his stomach. And in saying that, Jesus declared all foods clean. All right, that's, a, that's one application for both then and now. So there are some foods, like I don't do chocolate. Do you know why? I break out in high. I really do. You know, and so the problem is, yeah, I read this, and if I'm a literalist, I say, well, Jesus said I can eat anything. You know, and, but Jesus didn't say that. 
Jesus said, it, he's talking, using an analogy, a story to teach us about life, real life, not about chocolate, okay? So he goes on. What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean, unrighteous. So the shell game doesn't work because eventually the heart gets filled up with that anger, with that disappointment, with that fear, and it comes out in what you say and what you do. So it will eventually boil over and make you unclean, and the shell game will be revealed. Your heart was right there all along, all right? So from men's hearts, read it with me, would you? Come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All of these evils come from inside and make us unclean, unrighteous. And you go, really? Jesus just went from preaching to meddling, because that list probably hits each of us somewhere. So what are you going to do with a preacher like Jesus? Jesus teaches that our heart is dark because our spiritual eyes have been blinded. And a lot of times religion can blind us to the truth that God wants to teach us about our attitudes, about our culture, about our uh, thoughts or expectations about what is right and wrong. But here's the deal. Any heart can be hardened. It doesn't matter how far or close you are to God. It doesn't matter how pious or impious you are. It doesn't matter how spiritual or unspiritual you are. Any heart can be hardened. And here's my proof. It's a parable. The sun shines on soft clay. What happens to that clay? It gets really hard. The sun shines on a stick of butter, and it does what? It melts it. So this is the nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The exact same word preached by the power of the Holy Spirit will soften some hearts and harden others. And it's not God. It's the same God speaking, the same gospel being spoken. It is the condition of your heart. So this morning, some of you, your hearts are being hardened. I don't believe this. It's not true. It's your interpretation, Jerry. Well, then great. Find your interpretation, but let it come from here, the book of life, and not from Facebook, okay? So here's the deal. Is your heart being hardened, or is it being softened for God's truth? Some want to stay in darkness. You don't believe me? Read the opening of John's gospel, talking about what came. Some went away from the light because they did not want their evil hearts to be revealed and they wanted to remain hidden in their shame and pain. So how heavy is your soul this morning with the weight of your sin? And sin does have weight. It shows up in a broken and an angry spirit. It shows up in someone who people... oh. God, I can't believe he's come again. Or they see your name on the caller ID and they want to find anywhere else to be other than there to answer the phone. Some people we are pleased to see come and others we're pleased to see go. So how heavy is your heart with a way to sin? I'm not saying, do you feel good about yourself? I'm saying, the Bible's clear. Love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. So if you say you love God and who you have not seen, the brother of Jesus says, and yet you hate your neighbor who you have seen, then the truth, the light is not in you. Your heart has been hardened and not melted. Uh, have you broken any of the big 10 this week? Anybody? Will they find the body by next weekend? All right. The, here's the truth. Jesus really does move from preaching to meddling. And here's how he does it. In Matthew 5, 21, he says, you've heard that the law of Moses says, do not what? How many of you believe murder is wrong? Okay, for the rest of you, there's a guy in the back taking down names. All right. If you commit murder, you're subject to what? Who are you to judge me? Whose judgment is it? God's judgment. And so if you, even if you happen to be in a crazy period of time where murder, such as the murder of an unborn child, is legal, it remains what? Immoral, which means it is subject to the judgment of God. So if anybody's had an abortion uh, or counseled somebody to have an abortion, hear this truth.
God's grace is greater. I remember a young woman came to my office uh, at Pasadena. I was a young pastor, and she closed the door, and uh, she sat down, and her eyes were red. She'd been crying, and she couldn't get the first few words out because she was... (laughs) And then she says, I just drove by a playground. And uh, every time I go by a playground, and it's got kids that are three or four or five years old, I just I weep uncontrollably. I have to pull the car over, and so I thought I'd come in and talk to you. So we talked for about 30 minutes, and then it came out that she had had about three or four years prior to that an abortion. On the recommendation of, you know, the Methodist Church says we, we recognize termination of light through abortion sometimes is, is the hard right answer. But um, here's the truth. So we talked, and we finally discovered why she would weep uncontrollably, because she missed that child. She had named that child that never drew its first breath. And so her soul kept track. And I don't care what organization tells you that that seed of darkness isn't there, you know in your heart that it is. And what is the only sin that can't be forgiven? The unconfessed sin. So right there and then, she opened her heart up to God, and she confessed, I did what I thought was right. But I know now I killed my baby. And she weeped. And it wasn't for the last time, but it was a release of the tears and the pain and the shame and the anger at herself and those that she listened to that gave her the advice that crippled her. And she walked out of there with a limp, but she walked out of there convinced she was forgiven because she was. I'm not here to argue the legality of so many things in this world today. But I'm saying, put it against this. What does the Lord require? To love justice, to act with mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Because we are subject to God's judgment, no matter what the law of the land says. So he goes on and he pushes deep into this. He says, but if you, I say if you're angry with someone, it's not just murder. You are subject to judgment. And if you curse someone, how many of you ever cursed anybody? Some of you are just not ready to open up this middle cup. Some of you, you know, it's funny, you know, on the way to church, you're yelling at the kids, you're screaming, you're fussing, you're fighting. You pull in the parking lot and you put on your church face. All's good with the world. I'm good, really, I'm fine. I'm fine. You're a good Southern gal, aren't you? Put your crazy away and then make sure you pick it up on your way out of church. But you know it's there. So the judgment isn't just in time's judgment. It's the way you judge yourself. I failed. I've fallen. I'm broken. And I can't get up. So you're in the dangers of fires of hell. Hell here on earth. Filled with sleepless nights, with unanswered questions, with fears that can overwhelm you when the noise of the world quiets down and you're left alone with your own thoughts. You've heard it said, but now God wants to have you hear the law of grace. You can be forgiven. We all fall short of the glory of God, we're all sinners. That's our heart. We read about that at the beginning of this message. But the Bible also talks about the heart of Jesus. In John 15, it says this. My command is with me. Love each other as I have loved you. Forgive. Wait, 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 wait. Love each other as I have loved you. Father, forgive them. They didn't know what they were doing. That's what I prayed with that young lady in my office at Pasadena. She did what she thought was right, what was necessary. And so the words of Christ weren't spoken just over the people who were crucifying him then, but spoken over us for the weight of our sin. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Read it with me. Would you? Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus did that. And Jesus asks us to die to ourselves to get off our high horse and to stop judging others and to stop judging ourselves. 
You did the best you could. You did what you thought was right. And let's be honest, sometimes you knew what you knew was wrong. Sometimes you thought you'd get away with it. Sometimes you thought that the pleasure outweighed the long-term pain. But Jesus says over you and over me right now, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And it's not just over anger, and it's not just over lust. It's over all of the Big Ten and so many more issues that make us human. We all fall short. The answer is love not hate. The answer is finding unity together in Jesus Christ, his blood. It's not a finding division because your sin is worse than my sin. No, it's not. I'm not saying all sins are equal. That's nonsensical. If you think that God sees stealing a pen the same thing as raping someone, you got to rethink that, okay? Read some of your Old Testament. There's different penalties for different sins. But all sin separates us from God other people. So in that sense, all sin is the same. It separates us here on earth and in heaven. The heart of Jesus Christ reveals the heart of his Father, our Creator God. There's a pastor in Ohio who happened to have a heart surgeon in his congregation. Uh, The pastor asked uh, this heart surgeon if he could sit in and watch a heart surgery. I had the privilege of doing something similar when I was doing my clinical pastoral education at the University of Kentucky uh, Medical Center. And an anesthesiologist turned out, he and I started talking theology, and he said, do you want to scrub in and watch? I think it was a resection. And I said, sure. It was kind of weird. You know, it kind of looked like when you're field dressing a deer, except all the smells and the sounds are wrong. They're talking about what they're doing for dinner, and I'm going, this is creepy. (laughs) you know, give me a bow, give me a gun, and get out of my way. But I ain't going back in that operating room unless it's me on the table. Just want to know right now. But this guy asked if he could watch a heart surgery. And the guy said, sure. So the day came, the patient was rolled in. Uh, They cut open her chest, and they took out her heart and repaired it. And then before they can close, they have to restart the heart. And her heart wouldn't start. So the doctor got down on his knees and he said, Mrs. Johnson, this is your doctor. We have fixed your heart. Mrs. Johnson, if you can hear me, I need you to tell your heart to beat again. And it began to beat. True story. Now listen to me. The great physician, Jesus Christ, has fixed our broken hearts by what he did on Calvary's cross. But we listen to the voice of the enemy. The voice that lies. You're not forgiven. You can't be forgiven. You you can never forgive whatever it is that somebody did to injure you. You'll always be filled with evil desires. Satan says you'll never stop disappointing yourself or others or God. Give up. And Christ speaks into your reality just as that doctor spoke into that patient's reality. Your heart has been fixed by what Jesus did. Tell your heart to what? Beat again. Listen to me. You can be forgiven. I don't care what it is. You can forgive. I don't care what they did or didn't do. You can walk out of the darkness right here and right now. Claim this promise from God. It's found in Ezekiel 26. Read it with me. I will give you a new heart with a new and right desires, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony heart of sin and give you a new obedient heart. Let's do that right now. You should have received a communion cup like this. And if you didn't, just raise your hand and somebody will bring you one, okay? Let's have a heart transplant. Heavenly Father,
I ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body of Christ. (sighs) Redeemed by his blood. Make us one in spirit together and, and one in the spirit that has come from the sacrifice of the Christ in these moments, Father. May that same spirit whisper to each of our hearts, your heart has been fixed. Now let it beat again. Father, come into this moment. Fill your children with the desire and the resolve to ask for forgiveness, to admit that we have been wrong, and to hear the voice that says, from heaven to you, Father, forgive them, for they really didn't know what they were doing. Cleanse their heart, soften their heart, clear their conscience, and give them a powerful sense that through this act of holy communion, the slate has been wiped clean. Not so we can go back out and get it dirty again, but so that we can rise from this operation table with a newness of life. Through the power of the Holy Spirit speaking to each of us right now, given by the grace of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, your Son, on Calvary's cloth, all to your honor and glory, Father Almighty, we surrender ourselves to you in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. Would you take that cup and open the bottom, the one with the little biscuit in it, and take that out, and as you prepare to eat it, hear these words. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So stop remembering your sin and remember your Savior. Take and eat. Now turn the cup over and open the juice. And remember that sin always requires sacrifice for the record to be cleaned. It's ever been so. It doesn't matter whether you're talking between you and God, making that relationship right, or making a relationship right here on earth. It requires a lifeblood sacrifice. Cheap grace is no grace. In this moment, receive the power to truly be forgiven and to truly forgive. Take and drink. Heavenly Father, in this moment, we have revealed our heart to you. Take it out and replace it with the heart of your Son. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. Dave? Yes. You'd like to stand? That's fine. This song is a Danny Gokey song called Tell Your Heart to Beat Again.
say goodbye to where you've been and tell your heart to beat again. It's all right now Love's healing Hands have pulled you through So get back up Take step one Leave the darkness Feel the sun Cause your story's far from over And your journey's just begun eyes and breathe it in let the shadows fall away step into the light of grace yesterday's a closing door you don't live there anymore say goodbye to where you've been until your heart I love that song, and I appreciate Dave bringing that out this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. I want you to give voice to that truth, to be a sea of Galilee that takes in forgiveness and gives it out. Don't be the dead sea that takes in forgiveness and doesn't give it. So I want, I'm going to count to three, and I want you to bring up the most difficult relationship you have. And I want you to say this to them in your mind, but giving voice. I want you to say on the count of three, I forgive you. One, two, three, I forgive you. Let your heart beat again. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's kids said, amen. Amen. All right, I hope to see you guys at 4 o'clock for a great gospel sing. We're going to pull out the hymnals of all things. Go figure that.